In this video, we're going to talk about magnetic shielding in nuclear magnetic resonance. So we have our Hamiltonian here for a two-state system. We can either have a hydrogen or a proton nucleus, which is either spin up or spin down. And that Hamiltonian is minus gamma, uh, the magnetic field in the z direction, times the z component of the spin angular momentum of the nucleus. And that gave us energy levels for the uh, spin for the z component eigenvalue of plus or minus one half for a proton of minus or plus h bar gamma times the magnetic field in the z direction. And this value gamma here is equal to a constant called the nuclear factor, which depends on the nucleus, and times the uh, nuclear magneton, which is a value which depends on the charge of the nucleus and is divided by two times its mass. So it's the mass to charge ratio of the nucleus divided by two. Then for these energy levels, to transition from the low energy level to the high energy level, you need to absorb a photon, which is the energy change divided by Planck's constant, and that is equal to gamma times the magnetic field divided by two pi to get a frequency nu in hertz. Okay, so that's all with uh, just kind of our default nucleus here, but we know our nucleus has a chemical environment. It has electron density around it in whatever electrons are present in the molecule. So what happens is electrons are going to generate a magnetic field because electrons do have spinning your momentum themselves and they're going to generate and interact with the magnetic field as well. So they're going to generate a magnetic or an electronic magnetic field, B elect here, and this is going to oppose the direction of B naught of our standard our standard uh, magnetic field here. So if we have our BZ which is acting in the plus Z direction, then our B elect is going to go in the opposite direction. It's going to oppose whatever direction our standard, whatever our default magnetic field is. So in this case, what we're going to have is that our electric field, our magnetic field generated by the electrons is going to be minus sigma times B naught, which is going to be our uh, magnetic field here with no shielding. And this quantity sigma here is going to be called the shielding constant. Because what's effectively happening here is you have a magnetic field of a given strength and that magnetic field is opposed by the electronic magnetic field and decreased. So our nucleus is shielded from the full strength of this magnetic field by a small amount which is going to be this shielding constant here. And this shielding constant is typically on the order of about 10 to the minus fifth. So it'll be on the order of uh, one part per hundred thousand uh, relative to the external magnetic field. Okay, so that gives us a total magnetic field here. So we're going to have BZ equals B naught, the default value without any shielding, times one minus sigma. So this is our new magnetic field in the z direction which our nucleus feels due to the decreased magnetic field of the shielding. Now our frequency here in the absence of any shielding was equal to gamma bz over 2 pi but our bz has slightly decreased here so what we're going to see is that the value of b naught is equal to if we solve for, solve for uh, bz here rearrange the formula for B naught, what we're going to have is B naught is 2 pi nu over gamma times 1 minus sigma. So what we see here is that we have a correlation between sigma and B naught, and that is that, let me go to the other side of the page here, as sigma goes up, sigma goes up then this term in parentheses gets smaller, our denominator gets smaller, and when our denominator gets smaller, this whole term gets bigger. So when sigma goes up, B naught is going to go up as well. 
So as a nucleus gets more and more shielded, it takes a larger and larger um, external magnetic field in order to generate the resonance frequency. The resonance frequency gets higher as your shielding increases because you have to increase the field strength higher and higher to account for the larger amount of magnetic field which is getting shielded away by the electrons. And then as we know from organic chemistry studying uh, NMR spectroscopy, we know that sigma is going to depend on the local chemical environment, specifically on the electrons which are closest to this hydrogen nucleus and how they uh, react relative to some reference value. So what we see here is that the more electron withdrawing the local environment or whether whatever substituents are attached or nearby to our nucleus, more electron withdrawing uh, substituents, more electron withdrawing local environment is going to make sigma go down. There's more shielding when there's more electron density present. So if you had a bunch of electron donating substituents nearby, you would have a higher sigma and you'd have more shielding. But electron withdrawal will decrease the amount of electron density nearby and decrease the shielding. So this is one reason why uh, tetramethylsilane is chosen as the reference in proton NMR spectroscopy because TMS has a very high value for sigma. The protons in TMS are very well shielded and thus they're going to be appear on a slightly different part of the spectrum relative to everything else. It's going, they take a much higher magnetic field to generate their resonance frequency than most typical uh, protons which are in our typical organic molecules. Okay, so now that we've defined this value of sigma, this shielding constant, we can define a quantity called uh, the chemical shift as well, which we're going to look at in the next video. So this is indicated by the lowercase Greek symbol delta. And delta, as I said, is called the chemical shift. And we're going to see in the next video how delta and sigma are related to one another. So our chemical shift here, delta, or delta H, if you want it for a given proton, if we're doing some proton NMR, is equal to 10 to the sixth times the resonance frequency of our given hydrogen, delta H, minus the resonance frequency of the protons in TMS, in tetramethylsilane, which as we saw, it has very high shielding, so that means it takes a very large magnetic field in order for that to occur, and thus it's going to have a high frequency at which its uh, resonance frequency occurs. So the TMS has a very high value there for nu. And then this is divided by the frequency of the spectrometer, however many hertz that is, uh, typically in measured in megahertz. So if you have, for example, a 300 megahertz spectrometer, this would be, that would be 300 million hertz. Okay, and then I'll just go ahead and write down and enumerate that as well, that new for the spectrometer is equal to the spectrometer frequency. And when we're calculating chemical shifts, we want to make sure that we take care to put that value in hertz because this value of, of uh, delta here, this is actually a unitless value inside of these parentheses. And then when we multiply it times 10 to the sixth, it gets a unit called parts per million or PPM. So this is in PPM or parts per million. Because when you're taking this 10 to the 6, you are multiplying by a million, getting you parts per million. Okay, and then the last thing which we'll mention, uh, since this is defined relative to the frequency of TMS on the spectrum, then by definition the chemical shift for TMS is defined to be 0, 0.0 ppm. So it is, in fact, 
the reference signal because everything is defined in reference to TMS on our spectrum. So in the next video, we'll see how chemical shift and shielding are related to one another.